We talk a lot about creativity, but have you ever wondered where it comes from or how it happens? There are a handful of major theories on creativity, so let's take a look. First is the psychoanalytical theory of creativity. This theory is touted by Freud and Jung. Continuing the work of psychoanalysis, the assumption is that we humans have repressed emotions. These emotions are strong feelings that we cannot express because if we did, we would not maintain our integrity as part of civilization. And we can thank the superego for keeping those repressed emotions in check. When a situation gets difficult, Creativity allows the expression of our repressed feelings in a suitable manner. In other words, the artist gets to work through their personal emotional junk. But why would we care if we're not the artist? Because as viewers, we have emotional junk too. The expressions of creativity allow we viewers to experience pleasure and entertainment. Therefore, we don't have to face our difficult repressed emotions and can continue to keep them stuffed deep down inside. Next is the mental illness theory of creativity. Just as it sounds in the name, the idea here is that people have to have some sort of mental illness, even if it is in a mild form, to be creative. In society, we often describe artists as moody or depressive. Well, maybe there's some truth to it. Because of that natural state of reflection within illness as depression, bipolar, etc., the extension of creativity doesn't seem like a big leap. The energy of a manic state might be described in very similar terms as an artist who is struck with inspiration. But on the other hand, mental illness creates a number of barriers to, to creativity too, like a bad mood or low energy. So um, certainly if you subscribe to this theory, you must keep it in balance. The creative theory of psychoticism is similar to that of mental illness in that it supposes that creatives or those who are creative must have a disposition for psychotic thoughts and behaviors. This state of psychosis may relate to some mental illness, but not all mental illnesses. This requires the rejection of social norms in order to pursue a state that's half normal or just enough to pass and half creative. So that creative part is always to trying to break out of the normal part. There are many behaviors associated with psychosis that are similar to those of uh, those of creatives, um, impulsivity, sensational, um, lively, unpredictable. So this is one of the theories that has gained some attention in the past. Like the theory of psychoticism, the theory of addiction and creativity has uh, supposed some links between the two. Addictive substances like alcohol and drugs may contribute or even cause creativity for those who are heavy users. Because using substances recreationally may reduce stress and stress is a barrier to creativity, it's easy to draw a line that one leads to the next. Chronic abusers may find themselves in a creatively oppressed state though. They're subject to an inability to function or think while under the influence or without the influence because of withdrawals. The thought process can be scattered while under the influence and may lead to uh, creative development or creative delay. Finally, the humanistic theory of creativity is addressed in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We must meet the most basic of six needs before we are able to thrive and self-actualize enough to express our creative self. To be fully self-actualized means to be comfortable in identity, appreciation, and autonomy. According to this theory, when we become our most actualized self, that's our best self, we're not hungry, we're not scared, we have shelter, that's when our creativity can thrive. This requires that we develop trust and acceptance. And when we are distracted by meeting the needs on the lower levels, we cannot function at the highest level. And that is the level of creativity. So in other words, when we are distracted by some of our more basic needs, our needs for uh, human, uh, human connection, our needs for um, hunger, for thirst, and for shelter, then we don't have the ability to be creative because our attentions are focused elsewhere.
different things and blends them into one better thing. This can apply to language or solutions to a problem. Once two common things are outside of their standard element, we can begin to examine and consider them in a different form, which in turn causes us to apply different applications to the newly combined form. No matter where creativity is born and what theory you subscribe to, arriving at creativity is a process. Although many people achieve their creative goals in a variety of ways, there are some core steps in the creative process, and we can all use this information to apply and enhance our own personal process. First is the incubation portion of the process. This is where we take a break from the question or project, and that break results in an aha moment or a breakthrough thought. During this break, we might work on something that is completely unrelated, which gives the, uh, the problem or the creative expression a chance to simmer in the back of our mind. Honing is another part of the process. This is where we fine tune how we view our relationship with the project or question at hand. Every problem or creative endeavor includes a back and forth between the medium and the creator, between the machine you want to create and who you are as an engineer, between the painting you want to paint and who you are as an artist, between the problem you want to solve and who you are as a thinker.